Well, this was not at all the podcast that I was expecting it to be. <laughs> Welcome back, people, to another episode of the Talking TV podcast. This is our third one for the month of April. I am joined for the first time in a while by my good friend, Sean, of Math Teacher Movie. Sean, I believe the last time you were on was when we were breaking down the Better Call Saul series finale, which, God, I can't believe that was almost a year ago now. That's insane. But it's nuts that that's a year ago because I just yeah. moved into my new house. So like, yeah, yeah I was about to say, I'm, I'm like, year. I'm like, you got, a, you got a nice little aesthetic going on back there behind oh, yeah, you. I like is, uh, it. Yeah, my grandfather's basement. Um, yeah, nice, nice. Hey, at the very least, you're not like in, in like a compressed apartment anymore. Trust me, I, exactly. I know the that feeling is there. <laughs> yeah, and we are here to talk about the third feature film from one of my favorite filmmakers ever. I say that with as much sarcasm as I could possibly put in there. <laughs> Ari Aster. Bo is Afraid, which was re- which was uh, retitled from its previous title, Disappointment Boulevard, which I'm like, when it had that title, I'm like, okay, this movie is just setting itself and everyone else up for failure. And now, yeah. I don't know. You, you have anything to say before we get into this? Because I'm just oh, like... Just in regards to the title, I do think like, yeah, it's it's right not to name a movie a disappointment. But at the same time, <laughs> that after seeing the movie... Not that I'm saying the movie's a disappointment, but after seeing it, that title actually makes a lot of sense. It actually makes like, a so lot I kind of, of sense. I kind of like it better than Bo is Afraid. I get why they did it. Yeah, I I'm like, I, I'm just saying right off the bat, there's like in, in my never ending shit, like like shit train on Ari Aster. Bo is Afraid, not a fan of the title. But <laughs> will that be the only disappointing thing about this movie? You guys might be surprised. All of that and more on today's episode of the Talking TV Podcast. Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! Oh boy! It is another. It, it, it is another uh, momentous occasion here on the Talking TV podcast. So this is a little bit of an interesting one because I, I feel like th- this is a movie that is that that is part of such a significant chain of events that that has occurred in the cinephile world specifically for the last couple of years. But it's the first time that we're really covering it on this podcast because I, I I believe that Chris and I have mentioned Ari Aster's first two films, which we unfortunately did not get a chance to cover on the podcast because we didn't actually start it until about a couple months after we actually saw Midsommar in theaters before. So, Sean, happy to have you back on. I'm glad that you were able to jump on with me this morning in order to talk about this. I figured you of all people would have just like a perfect way to describe just your feelings towards Ari Aster, towards his, towards his films. I wanted to start with you before before we got into being my complicated relationship to say the least that i have with him so first off how you been overall it's been a minute since we've had you on i've been great i've been great it's great to uh see you it's great to be on the pod again very happy yes. to be here <laughs> yes indeed yeah Ho- hopefully like i said we can get you on more times throughout this year Definitely. because like yeah. i said it is it, it, the these two few these few and far between ones they're just it's not the same you know and now ari aster when did you first become aware of him when did you realize whether you liked him or didn't like him all, all, all that jazz <laughs> I think the thing about Ari Aster that I know about, I mean, I, I think I was too afraid to see Hereditary in theaters. And so I just saw it like, you know, during the daytime on my lovely living room TV. So no monsters could get me. Um, and I saw Midsummer in theaters. And I think with those two movies and this one as well, um, he is a spectacular, spectacular director, like yes. technically amazing. But this dude has like severe issues that he works out in his films. And he like they are just can be very confusing. Now, sometimes that works with Hereditary, and sometimes it doesn't work with Midsommar. I think that that movie, like in the third act, when you're supposed to be the most scared, when you don't exactly know what's going on, I can't really be too scared. And I should say, Bo is Afraid is not really a horror movie, it's an anxiety movie. Um, there's right. not really terribly like the classic scares in there. It's more of like, you know, you're looking deep into yourself and you don't like what you see. And that's where like you explore yourself here. But once again, it's just so odd and so weird. It's just weird enough for me not to like completely love his movies, even though like, like truly like there's every shot is framed beautifully. Like there's so much busyness going on in the background. And I'm like, this guy is one of the most talented filmmakers but just like goes down the like his movies just kind of go a little bit off the rails for me, which is just a shame, but I still like them. <laughs> yeah. A little bit off the rails. I feel like is the, is the best way to possibly describe how I feel about him. So I'll explain it. So back in 2018, 
You know, I, 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 Dustin and I always call 2018 the year of directorial debuts because there were just, mm. it felt like every other movie that we were getting was a directorial debut. That was the year of, again, the, the, the big ones, mid 90s. Um, Thoroughbreds was a one that I really liked. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, what's it called? Uh, eighth Grade, Bo Burnham's directorial debut. Um, even though probably not technically, I think he already had a couple of the comedy specials beforehand. Uh, Blind Spot yeah. and Carlos Lopez Estrada's directorial debut, uh, amongst many, many, many others. It just felt like we were getting, um, what's it called? The Boots Riley one that Boots I was about to Sorry, to, rather, sorry yeah. to bother you. Yeah, that that's another like big one that that was making waves, and it felt like each one of these movies had their like their little moment in like the pop culture lexicon. And this is easily the biggest one. It was a smash hit coming right out of Sundance. Everybody was talking about like you know, oh, the, the so scary that uh, you know that we had to walk out of the theater. You know, the the whole all, all those stupid charts that were trending through social media of like you know how high the anxiety levels rode, <laughs> shit like that. You know, and I watched Hereditary. And for about the first two thirds of it, I was enamored because I'm yeah. like, this is unlike anything that I've ever seen before. I, I don't know whether to make what to make heads or tails of it. And, you know, like like the, the, the build up to like the little girl getting her head knocked off with the telephone pole. Oh, I was like, oh, that was an audible, like got an audible gasp for me. That's really, really entrenched. And I'm like, OK, I'm, I'm invested. I, I want to know what's going on. I want to know if, if is this a cult? Are they like actually being haunted or is this just like a case of her being nuts, you know, and, and it got probably one of the best performances I've ever seen out of Tony Collette and also yes. Alex Wolf, who's kind of like the underrated scene stealer and mm -hmm. Gabriel Byrne. And then we get to the third act and that twist happens twist. I say, and my yeah. whole theater erupts with laughter, like erupts with laughter. And I'm like, I'm looking around and I'm like, was this supposed to happen? Like, was was this the intended effect to just make us all laugh? I'm like, am, am I being punked? I thought I was on an episode of like, I'm, I'm like, I'm waiting for the cameras to come out. I'm like, I'm, am I on an episode of punked here? Like, what's going on? Like, so I'm like, so I came out of that movie and I'm like, I didn't really know how to feel about it. And then about a year later, I saw Midsommar in theaters. And from the open, unlike uh, Hereditary, uh, from the opening scene of that movie, I'm just like, after the opening scene, I should say, which was pretty compelling and pretty disturbing, I was just bored. I was bored, yeah. and I'm like, it, this is predictable. This is annoying. I know exactly what's going to happen. These characters are, like, kind of even more one-dimensional than traditional horror characters, you know? Like, wh 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 and, and, like, try to cast certain characters. And, like, the only gimmick, it, it's clearly, like, the in the Wicker Man, and the only gimmick that it's got going for it is the acid trip scenes, which are amazing, and probably yeah. the most accurate that I've ever seen an acid trip sequence portrayed on screen before, and the fact that it's set during the daytime. And that's yeah. all it has going for. And it honestly, it was started, it was kind of falling into a little bit of the trappings of, oh, is this guy just kind of overhyped? Because I will say, as a craftsman, he does it like very, very few others. Like, I've, I've been talking over the last uh, about a year and a half now about the new generation of film brats. You know, that I've included such uh, people like Ryan Coogler, like the Safety brothers, like Jordan Peele, uh, you know, to name to name just a few. There's yep. many the others. Robert Eggers is in there. And Ari Aster, I gotta say, he has definitely earned his spot in there, for sure. But my whole thing is, it's like, you could be a brilliant craftsman, but just in order to appeal to me, you have to like... <laughs> the movie has to like be enjoyable somewhat and i'm like i had one movie that i enjoyed two-thirds of and i had another movie that i just could do without and so needless to say i was skeptical. needless to say i was skeptical going into Bo is afraid i'd heard that he said okay this isn't going to be like a straight i because again the thing that he said what i he felt was going against both of his first two movies was that they were marketed heavily. A24 marketed them as horror movies. And he's like, I, yeah. I I can't necessarily say that that was my intention to make them all entirely horror movies. It's always his intention going into Bo is Afraid was like, yes, th this is not going to be a horror movie. It's going to have some freaky moments in it for sure, but this is not going to be a horror movie. And I have to say that coming out of it, he definitely made a movie unlike anything that I've ever seen before, <laughs> for sure. Like I, I could definitely say that. Now, whether it worked as a movie or just as a really, really well done visceral experience, I'm still trying to figure that out. But in terms of definitely my own personal enjoyment, this is easily the most entertained that I've ever been yeah. in, of, of, of any of his movies, of any of them, like easily. I mean, it's genuinely funny and yes. uh, like in this like dark fashion. Um, but the, I just was so enamored by the chaos that he portrays. And I think it's easier to accept this movie as it is just like 
an issue of something in his head. Now, you know, obviously this is the type of director that will never answer the question of, is this all in his head or is this actually real right. and in a fantastical world? He doesn't want to incriminate himself. Exactly. And that's how most artists are anyway. Exactly. Right. Um, so, and, and listen, but... <laughs> it's what David Fincher said best. He's like, all, I believe that all artists are perverts and we have to keep reminding people of that. And I'm like, yeah, yeah you, you couldn't have said it better yourself if you tried. It helps that this guy like has severe like mental issues of anxiety and depression. And so like when he's walking down the street and people are just like buying AR-15s out of a stand and, you know, there's people charging at him. That is like his own anxiety, like just being portrayed right. on this. So right. it's it's not as bad as he like looks it to be, but it is just like through his own experience and therefore through our experience, we face that anxiety, which is I think was like the most brilliant aspect of this. For that, yeah. Opinion. Honestly, look, looking back, it's like it's pretty impressive because throughout the entire time, specifically that first act, right? That's the other thing we should mention. This is a three hour long movie, and I will say <laughs> that for my money, it there are certain points where I felt the length, but for the most part, it flew by, and and I, I, and I thought it was. Cut. I mean, it was I wouldn't paced. know what to cut. Right, yeah. it was paced very well, and I, once again, like every time you see one of these things, you hear there's a longer cut of the movie, and I'm like, oh my god, like I can only imagine what that would include. But <laughs> yeah, the, the the thing that I was watching is uh, I, I was a little bit of like a halfway point of like, is he trying to portray like you know his worries about the modern day, you know, in terms of like you know us devolving into chaos and us only you know just you know just devolving into this like you know dystopia where uh you know people are just rioting on the streets and are just like you know making videos for attention and all that because they see that that's the only sport form of value anymore and like this guy who's like so anxious that like he doesn't even want to leave his apartment i'm like is he like i'm like is he trying to make a statement or a commentary or are these just like his own inner feelings uh, uh, like of, of, of dealing with like the last two years and he definitely does not makes a statement on masculinity when it comes to uh the like very last act and how he deals with his mother and like you know how he has dealt with sex this entire time and i like i really loved the idea of like masculinity through therapy yeah. Um, especially like keeping it like through traumatic relationship, keeping the most masculine thing of all time, which is a little shop of horrors penis monster in the basement tucked away and just taking away that and like having that be like this unrelenting monster, which obviously that's the part that everyone's talking about is the gigantic right. pizza penis monster. Pizza right. Penis monster. See, it, it's yeah. so funny that because like the, the it's so funny because the penis monster for me was just like, that's just like the last tidbit on the back of my head at uh, the back of my head. Because again, this moment, it's so weird because it's the exact moment that turned me off to hereditary, but the moment where again, my theater just lost it and where yeah. I finally finally realize i'm like throughout the whole because this is what well like probably like what two two we're about like 215 almost two and a half hours in Pretty right much, yeah, yeah I, I i think you know which moment i'm about to talk about where he he's at he's at his mother's he he finally made it he was late for the funeral um this is right before he realizes that she's still alive which the, the whole fake out of the death we'll get to in a bit <laughs> but where he meets up with parker posey who is you know the older version of I just need a minute in order to build up to this because this thank is so God it was Parker Posey, by the way. What an God, amazing right? idea for a cast. This, <laughs> this moment was so ridiculous. And I was like, hi, he's, he's finally realized it. it. It was the Christopher Nolan tenant moment where it's oh, like yeah. the machine has finally become aware. It took three movies and five years or six years, however long it's been since 2018, but the machine has finally become aware of what it is, which is it was so effing stupid. Throughout the entire time, you you you're you're having flashbacks of like his childhood of, of his mom, which by the way, Zoe Lister Jones, they did a great job of making oh, her yeah. look like a younger Patty Lupo. Like that, like that was probably one of the best like castings for like a younger version of a character that I've seen in a while. And throughout throughout his entire childhood, in terms of like again factoring into this idea of like of like diminished of of what's it called of diminished masculine you know emasculation all that um through the maternal figure and such which is clearly again a, a big focus in this movie i was actually like kind of impressed that he was able to pull that off you have his mother telling him that like he can't have sex because the whole thing is it, it all ties in because the way he was conceived was his dad died upon the moment of conception and apparently there's a history of that throughout his family so he's lived his entire however old he is i mean they say he was born in 75 and if this is in 2022 that would put him around like 45 46 years old and so he's lived his entire life thinking that he cannot that if he has sex he'll die so naturally when he finally meets up with parker posey who like they you know they met his kids they had like a little childhood crush on you know when they finally meet up again as adults at the funeral she she instigates the idea to finally have sex and his face throughout it is insane because he's like, oh, no, oh, no, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Just like we'll, we'll get into Joaquin in, in a little bit. Yeah. because like Dustin and I already did like a Hall of Fame episode on this guy. But like 
I feel there's an argument to be made that this might be the, the greatest performance he's given, at least since the master, but like, we'll get into that. <laughs> so you finally hit the moment of, 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 of you know what? Um, <laughs> and, and, he, and he's finally satisfied. He's like, oh my God, I didn't die. And he looks up and Parker Posey is not only dead, but frozen on top of him. And my, we, we lost it. We lost it. It was like, I'm like, what? Well, it was brilliant because for like a very, uncomfortably long amount of time just after sex the, uh, like he's sitting there and he's like oh i thought i was gonna right. die and they, and they pause it they hold it on him for a of minute Posey. they, they <laughs> hold it on him for a moment and i'm like oh i'm like you she, see that she is completely oh, yeah. still and so there's that unsettling nature where you know obviously i don't think anyone knows what this movie is fully about at all no, no. but i i do think that you know it's like there's these moments where you just are getting unsettled because you are looking at this through his perspective and, and um, like, oh, it, it's man. so interesting because, like, again, this is another Joker situation where, the, again, Joaquin, I'm pretty sure, is in – with the exception, I think, of the flashback sequences. But, like, even in the flashback sequences, you feel Joaquin is pretty much hovering in, like, <laughs> at almost every frame of this movie. And, like, just the way that – like, look, so the thing that, I, that I'm trying to figure out is I'm like, is Joaquin's character supposed to be Ari in this instance? Because if, if that's the case, like – I mean, it wouldn't surprise me because I feel like again, this is this is the first because th put it this way, this is the first male protagonist that he's done in any of his movies. You know, the, oh, yeah. the, the protagonist in his first two movies are both female characters, so I think that was pretty telling. Also, this is the third instance where you have a main character that has like a somewhat messed up relationship with, oh, you know, yeah. with the rest of their family. You know, Tony Collette didn't have a good relationship with her mother, doesn't really have a good relationship with her son in Hereditary. Uh, Midsommar, Florence Pugh's sister, murders her entire family at the Jeez. beginning of the movie. And again, just we'll, we'll never forget that. So this is another instance of, again, just like our main character having like a messed up relationship where he's clearly shown at the beginning of the movie to be in this very, very toxic, controlling relationship with his mother where, again, it, to the point where it has just inhibited every single aspect of his life. And you see that, you know, as it continues, as he goes on his journey throughout the movie, you know, with his meetup with the family and then seeing their whole dynamic and then with, with, with the weird theater troupe. And then once he finally makes it to the mom's house and everything that goes down there. And also like, could we talk about how much of a fan of innate, like, uh, or, or, or uh, what's it called of uh, like innate architecture Ari is because every single one of his movies, it's like, it, it, aside from the movie set in the field, he's got, he's got a really, really good and unique sense of mise-en-scene and like, and like production design. Well, even in the one where it's set in the field, like there's the, the houses are like just perfect symmetrical right. houses to be like, if Wes Anderson was on an acid trip. And so yeah. like, those, those are like, you know, those like terrifying, like steep triangles are always like pretty, uh, pretty humbling to see yeah pretty unsettling yeah and it goes but, yeah into, like, the, the, the um the mom's house and seeing yes. that whole nature of it is just you know walking through those stairs right after it's just kind of like yeah. there's just an unsettling nature to it it's a cold place yeah. and, I and like that. he's dragging it out for sure like he's quite literally oh, yeah. having the main character like drag his feet as he's walking and plodding hmm. up the stairs a little bit but like and then once you like get to the attic and you have that like it's shot from like a wide slash close-up where it's like you can see everything that's happening in the frame but like he has the characters at a distance and then when you finally go up into the attic where you know the, every everything is you know clear all, all the secrets are clearly kept and like even Stephen the McKinley Henderson like once it's revealed that he's been in cahoots with the mom which is something that like I kind of had a feeling of because I'm like okay if they're setting up this mother character to be this way there's definitely going to be some instance of like you know some some collusion here and there you know if you will I just the, the way that he's smiling throughout the, the smile throughout really the entire, messed me just, up like probably just, one of the most unsettling performances I've seen like ever you know because he is always such a warm like you know yes. uh, wisdom filled figure and to have him be like someone who's evil and you kind of don't know why is just right. like and comedically goofy with his evil nature yeah. is just really unsettling but i mean that was that last scene the trial scene is just an ex exact interpretation of what like therapy is like yeah. where you're you're cracking yourself open you're examining all these terrible parts of yourself and you end up hating yourself because of it and you know i'm an advocate for therapy because eventually it turns around better but right. you go through a lot of dark shit first and then you come out on the other side well, and he's in his dark too shit and what's interesting, too, about that last act as well is it's like it, it's almost in, in an instance, I feel like taking the opposite stance on therapy where it's it's, it's weaponized therapy. It's therapy. Oh, for yes. means of, it's therapy for means of control, not for yeah. means of healing, you know. And now, again, is that another portrayal of Ari's deep 
uh, deep laden insecurity. You know, I, I refer to him as Ari now, but in 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 a personal sense, I feel I feel like after watching this movie, I feel like I've got even more we know personal him. connection. We know we, him we know very him. well. I, I, this is the third time, all right. He's been opening himself up to us like for a while now. He's 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 he's, he's, he's made us very well known about him. But yeah, so it, it, it's therapy for means of control. It reminds me of again like a more hyper exaggerated version of the therapy scenes from Mad Men. Like you remember when when mm-hmm. Betty was going to like a therapist and and Don was just like you know getting. Don was just like, uh, what's it called? Uh, of you know, w- was in touch with the therapist. It was like get, receiving yeah. the 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 notes and the sessions on her. You know, it kind of reminded me of that a little bit. But like <laughs> oh in, the, in the reverse sense, where the, this whole thing has been. I mean, one could argue that this whole thing has been like an elaborate setup from the mom. You know, if you're discounting yeah. all the surrealist stuff in order to like get, get back at this perceived revenge of her son. You know, but also there's a sense of everything that McKinley Henderson has been saying has been true. Where in the sense of in the sense of where like yeah, the the, the mother has been like disturbed by the amount of autonomy that you're showing because you know now that since, since the husband died and you've seen this too in real life cases of like you know husbands dying and like mothers like coddling their children to the yeah. point where it inhibits their growth overall. You know, and I I, I think that like he captured that surprisingly really well like it's funny because when i realized that this was going to be surrealist and i realized it it took me a little while with this one it took me about like i'd say like an hour into the movie to realize where i'm like oh this is going to be surrealist but it still never lost track of its narrative because what i usually find in most surrealist pieces now is you start off with a somewhat compelling narrative and then it just delves into just into yeah. just surrealist nonsense to the point where it's like, what, what was the point of all of this again? You know, yeah, like this I, had a simple plot. This was, Hey, I have to get to my mother's funeral. Right. And that was just this bro- like, we're okay. So yes, there's a whole bunch of shit happening that is right. ridiculous, but it, it like, there was a common goal at the end and that goal was reached. Now then it was blown up completely yeah. capsizing the boat, but you know, it was literally. eventually reached. Yes. Yeah. Quite <laughs> literally. But yeah, I, I always think back to like when I saw um, what's called, I'm thinking of ending things back in mm-hmm. 2020 and like how that movie is just this surrealist, like dream of like placing the screen and then I come to find out it's about like a, a, a dude who's fantasizing about his ideal version of his wife and then kills himself at the end I'm like I didn't get that from the movie at all and the yeah, fact no, that I, I had, had to do a lot of reading yeah after and the that fact that I had to do that. reading on that in order to <laughs> understand that I'm like I know that there are people saying oh you know you have to look for the deeper meaning I'm like no but I shouldn't have to look that hard you know like yeah. like a movie shouldn't have its meaning buried so deeply that uh, that, that you have to do, like, extenuating research on it. You know, at the end of the day, it is still supposed to stand on its own, you know? So that's all the way, and, and the reading and the extra stuff is always supposed to be just extra stuff. So that, that's why I, I that, that movie still kind of loses me, where, uh, but but this one, yeah, e- even though you had the surrealist stuff, it, there was never a point where I lost track of what the main focus is. Like I said, these, about these uh, feelings of, like, very, very deep insecurities about one's mm-hmm. masculinity, and you know the the idea of you know the the the, the I, I forget the term that they use, but it's a but it's called the the chokehold mother, if you will, you know yeah. the overbearing mother, and just really really diving into that in ways that I just have never ever quite seen before. And it's all wrapped up. I mean, I gotta give a shout out to one of my friends, Peter, um, for uh, again, Patty Lupone. Holy yes. shit! Like yes. Oh my she god! She's are- getting Oscar buzz right now. I don't know if it'll be possible, but I would love to see that. I don't like- know, but like I said, the, the, the academy is just again. The, I don't know if it's they've got a vendetta against Ari, or he's still just too new. But like I said, everyone was batting a hundred for Tony Collette, and they're still complaining that she didn't get a nomination for. It's Hereditary. horror movies as well. That happened with Lupita right. Nyong'o for us. So horror movies right. don't get but a lot of attention. The other thing that I'll say as well is I think that the reason why, and this also has a lot to do with the movie's in- initial release window in which it's come out, is that I think that they're trying to posit this like. This is only what a month, uh, what just about a month after the Oscars, right? When this mm-hmm. movie came out, so I think that they're trying to posit this for potentially to be the everything everywhere spot for next year, yeah. if if they're able to pull this off. Because, like you said, this is the first movie that he's done that's not technically a horror movie. Yes, there is a lot of surrealism, but there, but there is like a deeper underlying message. And even though it it, it it's the first of his movies that I feel like balances the disturbing matter with the hysterical subject matter, which is something that I feel like he struggled with a lot in the fir- in his first two movies. It would be nuts if this is his first movie to get nominated for Academy Award, even if it's Patti Lapone. I would just be I, like, I wouldn't really? Be mad. This is I what would, he had to do? <laughs> I wouldn't be mad at all. We also know, again, that like the, the, the Academy loves not honoring uh, older actresses. I don't that believe... Would be a, Pat- it, it would be a I, huge thing. Like, I also really. don't believe that Patti's ever been nominated for an no. Academy Award before, which is insane to me when you consider yeah. her body of work and her overall talent body. But... Uh, yeah, so uh, I want to shift trajectory real quick here to talk about Joaquin just for a little mm-hmm. bit. Joaquin has talked that this is, has talked about and said that this is like one of the most w- w- one of the most uh, difficult uh, performances that he's ever 
that he's ever had to do. Um, and what's it called? It's interesting that like only two nights after, um, uh, only a couple, only a couple days after Dustin and I did our Joaquin Phoenix Hall of Fame, in which we crowned the master as the best performance that he's ever done. And yes. also, uh, you know, we 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 both honored Joker in a certain extent. Here you have a movie that I feel like mixes and blends the best aspects of both of those, where you have mm -hmm. the isolated, reclusive loner who also doesn't know how to function in the world. But this time you get like the backstory behind that and the reasoning for behind that. And I, again, like the, the way that this movie is framed, I, I think the other reason why this movie appeals to me so much is because it reminds me so much of the Odyssey. Like, this character really does go on like an Odyssean-esque yeah, adventure. And, and like the, and, and again, it, it doesn't use that many locations. Like it's his shitty apartment building. It, it's it's the Nathan Lane, Amy Ryan house. It's <laughs> it's the woods, and then it's his mom's like elaborate. Thing. So there's not that many locations. But the fact that you feel like you're traveling on this like very long journey with this character, and the fact that like the themes are still like very very apparent. It, it's it's I would say it's the first movie that he's done that I that I would say is masterful in terms of how it pulls all of those off. It's interesting because he um, he's playing, and this is a weird phrase to use, but he's sort of playing the straight man to the absurdity that surrounds him. Yes. A lot of this is him reacting and him yes. reacting quietly and having to like the camera holding on him for a bit and Astor sort of torturing him in that regard where he really has to react to, you know, from like notes under a door to, uh, you know, trying to buy a bottle of water. All of these like aspects just work so well. And um, I really loved like just watching him comedically react at times. And I think he was genuinely being comedic. I don't think this was accidental comedy at all. Um, but it was like upsetting to see this guy go through this stuff the whole way through. Oh, yeah. man. It, it was it, it, it's the it's the first time ever that like I understand Ari's anxiety because like the way that he like portrays all of the other characters around Bo is just being like everybody is just insane. Like like they're all but, but what, what's crazy about it is it's all people who you would believe would exist in the real world, you know, like from all of, all of the nut jobs in the first act to like, you know, the loving, caring family to like the weird, uh, you know, forest theater people who like clearly just don't want to have any interaction with society all the way up to the overbearing mother and the therapist. And but like portrayed in this hyper exaggerated surrealist manner, like I feel like my biggest problem with, with, with his first two movies is that you have characters that were for the most part like real people but acting in these imaginary circumstances that seem to just like go against them so it created like this level of dissonance there you know where you have like a bunch of people who are like acting relatively normal under very very rightfully so strange circumstances to pretend and trying to pretend like nothing is wrong you know versus in midsummer again they're in a field like so you know like where, where there was never any darkness they just watch two old people jump off cliffs and like not, not, nothing's wrong here. Nothing's wrong yeah, at all. It's cool. Like, but here it's like, no, there's a reason why Joaquin is freaked out. Like everybody around him is fucking insane, you know? And yeah. he's just trying to get to his mom, even though she has shown that she clearly like has some underlying resentment towards him. Yeah. So it is exactly like what I wanted, like this kind of movie to be where, like we said, it is a simple premise. Now there is so much crazy shit happening, but it's just such a like welcoming and simple premise where, you know, the other ones like, yeah, I don't I, I still don't know what Midsummer was about. Like towards the end of it, I don't know what the like I don't know what the resolution was there. Here, even though it is bonkers and it's a Richard Kind showing up at the very end also was just great to see. Oh, that was uh, awesome. That was awesome. <laughs> just as a horrible, like the just like the insecurity lawyer in there was right? just great. Oh, that was um, awesome. I, oh, I loved seeing that. Yeah, and, the um, stadium when, when they picked up his defense counsel and just chucked him down onto the <laughs> rock. I was like, oh my god. I love that you never see him at all. Like he's no, just from a distance the whole time. And, and he's occasionally shouting. like objecting, but it's never working. <laughs> oh man, just like I said, it, it's it's funny because like I said, it, like there's so much much stupid shit happening that like every moment i'm like starting to lose track something comes in it just makes me crack up laughing like oh, yeah. <laughs> oh man like everything going on with, with amy we're like look, when the daughter drinks paint and the fucking and, and he's just trying to react off i'm like this is stupid like what what is this like what is I, happening i really loved amy ryan and nathan lane's sort of portrayal because yeah like th that's one where you know they're if it was just them holding him hostage because of their uh, dead son, right? That would be it. boring. But they also have like they're they're watching him the whole time. One of them is thinking like you, but you Nathan don't Lane ever just get acting their movement. Like, Nathan Lane is hysterical <laughs> as the dad who just like is acting overly jovial one to Bo, and then just like turning around and like being an and just calling his daughter all sorts of names. It's like it's 
hilarious because it's Nathan Lane, right? I, Who you you also is another guy that you've got this like pre existing relationship with, oh, yeah. and, and he knows that to an extent, and he's playing that up like crazy. Where he's trying to portray him almost as like this, the, the you know this this boring suburban corny dad, and it's 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 all oh, man, it's so good. Um, I uh, want to just like go back to Ari Aster for a moment because this movie just solidifies it. Right after Midsummer came out, he did a Reddit AMA. And the top question was, are you okay? <laughs> and all he replied back was, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, At least he's honest. At least he's honest. I got to be honest. It's just like this is this is where he's delivering in his pocket. It's perfect. Yes. yes. I Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you there. Because, like, again, I, I'm thankful that he's finally – I feel like in a strange way, it sounds weird and antithetical to say about this movie, considering that, you know, that this movie is literally about a character who is some of the, some of the biggest mommy issues I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm glad that he's at least finding like some peace within himself, you know, and how he's having a little bit more fun and, and, and you know, and treating himself a little bit less seriously because you're right. Because again, I, I think that's the biggest difference between this and his first two movies is that this movie was a comedy. This was absolutely a comedy. Like there were so many moments where the characters where, where everybody in my theater was just cracking up laughing. And I finally got the sense of like, no, he's in on the joke now. He yeah. understands. Like, he's not like, th this isn't unintentional anymore. You know, like, like. We are also reason. living in this age of, um, you know, when you talked about in 2018 was director premieres. Now, not all these directors had a premiere in 2018, but all of them came up in the teens yes. where now they are given their bag. They're given their blank check. I think right. of Jordan Peele with Nope, Damien Chazelle with Babylon, Bo is yes. Afraid right here, Robert Eggers with The Northman. I yes. mean, all of these guys that are like just young and up and comers are now getting their movies. Now, some of them are received pretty well and some of them are given like somewhat mid reviews and it's interesting to see that this is the time where they don't have a producer that's telling them no. Yes. None of these guys are having a producer that's telling them no anymore. And I really love that idea where this is something a little bit more um, intense. And A24 and Blumhouse, where the majority of those filmmakers kind of live, right. is, you know, these are people that will make them do whatever they want. They can right. they can keep on going. But Bo is Afraid is the, like, latest example of, uh, yeah, this guy did not hear no. At all yeah, I'm, 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 I'm really glad that you brought that up because that, that's exactly it. Where again, I feel like that's part of the overall issue. And there was a little bit of commentary on that in this movie as well, with the idea of like, you know, where is all of the good art gone? And the, like I said, it's still around. It's just that there's much, much less of them, you know, being made into movies because a yeah. majority of them have gone to TV, right? Yeah. But the ones that are still around, that are still sticking it out, like I said, the ones that are the auteurs, you're right. We're finally getting to that level where these guys have been around. For a, a, a couple of years now, you like you said, Chazelle, uh, Coogler, Jordan Peele, um, this is the, the Safties, you know, our arguably uncut yeah, gems yeah. was like probably their version of that. And now and now yeah. they're doing stuff for Netflix, you know. So <laughs> you're right, all these guys have been around, and you're right, it, it primarily is with Blumhouse and A24 because they because they they are the only two studios that in the modern day have figured out how to make some really interesting movies with a mid budget with a mid-level budget. And I yeah. will say that this is probably the biggest budget that he's easily had to work with. They gave him 35 million. But now, whether this movie makes its money back or not, who knows? But I will say that, I, you know, at least for my money, um, I think that while this, I don't know per se how well this movie is going to do in theaters because I, I unfortunately don't know how well Ari Aster. Ari Aster's name brand has grown outside of the cinephile community the way that certain others have. But I will say that this is probably going to be another one that's going to have like a very, very long cult like existence, especially yes. once it hits streaming. Like once it hits streaming and, and everybody watches this, they're going to, I'm, I'm going to be getting like, I'm already anticipated like getting a bunch of texts like three months from now being like, Dom, have you seen Bo is Afraid? And I'm like, yes. <laughs> so I get Peter, or but it came yeah. out. Yeah, you, you know, I, I you, you say, have seen your friends like yeah. that. This is getting this is getting a cream to the box office with Evil oh, yeah. Dead Rise showing up at the same week. I mean, this is yeah. just going to get absolutely. And then you know, there's still Mario Tale happening. Yeah, and, Mario. You know, the, that Pope's Mario Exorcist. train is not stopping at like, all. The, the fact that Pope's Exorcist like got as did as well as it did just well, showed it that up against Renfield, which was like a lot. I feel in a way like a, a lot less straightforward of a movie. Now. Horror 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 movie. movie. Yeah, <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> April. April is like I'm like, and I'm looking back and I'm like, when did April become the month for horror movies? Like I'm looking at October and like I, I think that the the only horror movie we have is going to be the, the David Gordon Green straight to Peacock Exorcist remake, which I'm like, oh, if it's anything like those last couple Halloween movies. Jesus Christ so is the only thing I have to say. Oh, so and, worried. oh, not to mention Saw 
X, right? What, the, the 10th Saw movie or something like that? Like, I don't know. I might have to torture myself and watch all the Saw movies next. You know, I did it with Halloween. I, I think that's one where you don't exactly need the plot of all the different Saw movies <laughs> to understand what's happening in Saw 10. I think I yeah. think Saw kind of fills in. Yeah, like, I saw know. I saw that spy. We saw that Spiral movie with Chris yeah. Rock a few years ago, and that was that was easily one of the, one of the best podcasts ever for one of the worst movies that I've that I've seen like in a in a long time. <laughs> I remember I kind of liked that movie, but maybe because I just didn't really understand. What yeah, Saw I was about to say, I don't I don't think anybody likes that movie for like the actual quality of the movie. No, 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 not it's, at all. It's fascinating, <laughs> right? For sure, for sure. So speaking of which, uh, did you get a chance to watch Evil Dead Rise or no? I haven't, so okay. um, I will probably uh, let you go on that one. However, so, I just want to ask, like, yeah, yeah. I because yeah. I've seen the first three. I was about to say, I'm like, listen, I, I, I will say though, I'm like, we're, we're not done talking about Bones Afraid by any stretch of the imagination, but I did yeah. just want to like cut to that in terms of like the <laughs> title, yeah, because well, only because this is the only this is the first Evil Dead movie I've ever seen. I've never seen any of the originals oh. with Bruce Campbell, and I've never and I didn't watch the 2013 reboots. So this is the first. Yeah, I, oh. I had a a very large familiarity with the franchise. I understood like what it was about basically, but I, I just went into this and. Kind of was able to just appreciate it it's just like a straight like body horror movie which is what it kind of ended up uh, it was like a zombie movie it was it was a closeted zombie movie uh sorry a bottle zombie movie that's the term i keep uh screwing up a bottle zombie movie meets a really interesting body horror movie and probably the best like mix of like practical and cg effects that i've seen in a while i'm like right. not some of the best performances but just in terms of like yeah. just bloody disgusting subject matter it was it was a rip roaring it was a rip roaring good time for sure i'm, I'm just like I'm with this one and pope's exorcist coming out so close together yeah it's like i i just realized when i saw those trailers it's like i'm not really that scared of the devil anymore yeah. <laughs> like i don't know man well, it's, it's like just, it's because they, they know what they have it's just it's campy yeah. horror again it's like, it's like a kid with a deep voice I, you know i don't know man that doesn't freak me out anymore <laughs> it's like it, it listen the, the studios have finally understood that the only movies that make money in theaters that aren't the giant tent poles are horror movies yep. so the only ones, nothing else. I never see anything else in theaters, but that is not the big ten poles besides horror. And even they've finally also gotten it to a point where even the bad ones, quote unquote, are still entertaining. Like mm -hmm. Pope's Exorcist, you can't tell me based off that trailer that that movie wasn't going to be entertaining as hell. Same <laughs> way. So freaking dumb. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet, so I can't judge the movie. But that trailer made me <laughs> that say is I, one I, of the I'm dumbest trailers I've ever seen. And but at the same time, I'm like, at the back of my mind, I was like, I kind of want to watch this just to see how dumb it is, you know. Yeah. And it was kind of a similar thing with Renfield. It was a similar thing to an extent with Bo was afraid. Evil Dead Rise, I think, was the only one where I'm like, nah, that that's fucked up. I gotta see it. And, and the shit that they do with that movie, oh man, all I know is that the last time I got like a body horror movie this good was probably Malignant, which I don't care what anybody says, Malignant was fantastic. I will not hear a single thing against that movie. That movie was amazing. Uh, all I remember is I, I came down the next day and, and, and Dondre and I were talking. Dondre's been on this podcast before. And we were just staring at each other with wide eyes for like five minutes. And he was like, bro, a tumor? I'm like, yeah. I'm like, that was. It's literally <laughs> sisters. It's all literally can, Brian and DePalma's sisters. <laughs> all, he, all he could say was like that, like for five minutes straight. And l listen, James Wan, I, I, I bet sisters didn't have like some great like action sequences though. No, and I bet sisters didn't have like a, like, like a transformation in a prison cell. I'm like, you had an incredible Hulk like prison sequence. She had a face in the back of her face like, that movie's great that movie's awesome that movie was a was a was an absolute Doing the blast. tom green backwards man exactly get a big break out of i mean game. i was thinking more so professor Quirrell from the first harry That's potter also, but, that also works. but, but uh, I'll, I'll take that as well yeah so but yeah that evil dead rise like i said it was a lot of fun it was a lot of fun like i said it's it's a good bloody this uh, to quote luke of luke reviews it's a good bloody disgusting time so if i might check that one out that so it's gonna be a low like, on my list but i'll check that one out yeah like the scare i will say in terms of like getting the freaky subject matter right like it definitely hits that you know so like i said i haven't seen any of the first three evil dead movies i can't imagine this is going to be better than any of them but for my money yeah. it was just it was a good fun entertaining movie which is more than i can say for pretty much every movie that i've seen so far this year with the exception of a few but i'm <laughs> telling you man with Bo is afraid i'm not gonna lie with some careful reconsideration i this might be my favorite movie of the year so far which i'm like it's kind of baffling but like when you can first of all you, you have to consider a couple things number one the fact that the bar for movies has been set yeah so low like i didn't even know it was possible to be as low as it was like i thought it was bad last year it's even worse this year like and i feel like it gets worse progressively every single year i'm hoping that with the amount of like auteur driven efforts we're gonna get next year it can like bounce back a little yeah. bit but 2023 has been very, very lackluster disappointing so far. So I consider that. Number two, the fact that, like I said, this is the, the, the fact that, you know, I, I've seen this happen before where you have a director who one year releases a movie that just doesn't work out for me and then another year releases a movie that I'm absolutely in love with. And then 
On top of that, you have the fact that my favorite movies of the year so far have been the Tetris movie, Cocaine Bear, and Megan. Those are followed closely by the Super Mario Brothers movie. If that doesn't tell you about like what the caliber of movies just released in 2023 alone, then I don't know what does. So like, I think compa- Megan is the most important movie of the year. Truly, it's like, amazing. I, it's, Listen, it's, 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 has we, any we other movie of a horror franchise has any other movie been as viral as Megan has been this no. year? Not no. not what? Not not my money. All I know is Megan was the only movie that people in my school were actually talking about, and and, and it was hilarious seeing their reactions to it and everything. Like he, like I was talking to this one kid. I was like, Jordan, you watch Megan? He's like, Yeah. He's like, Man, that. She did a TikTok dance for that wasn't right. I'm like, oh, that was one of a few things that she did that just wasn't right. I remember thinking the trailer, like, yeah, how are they going to, like, you know, uh, contextually, um, like, bring that uh, TikTok, Megan TikTok dance in? Oh, they don't. I mean, oh, they don't. Not at all. The two second clip of teaching her how to dance. Yeah. That is it. That is it. (laughs) That is it. And, and, but they, they do what they had. Like I said, Blumhouse is the only studio that actually knows how to do viral marketing, um, unlike any other studio. So, yeah, I was like, I was a fan of that. But yeah, so bringing it back to Bo is afraid. Um, I feel like there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about, uh, but, but besides her, oh yeah. So the ending, so <laughs> he's in a boat and it's in the middle of a lake and it turns into like this big. So I, what's interesting is that one could make an argument that this is all in his head, Yeah. but I feel like because of the movie's inherent nature, I feel like there was still like a lot that could be interpreted literally, except for the last bit, the last bit when he's on the boat in the middle surrounded by the stadium and all that. I feel like that was like a little bit too elaborate to have been like completely set up. So like, you think that part was all in his head? You think he actually died at the end? Because I'm like actually kind of curious about that. So I really think like that all in his head is an interesting way to put it. Cause I, I, I brought that up at the beginning and I think it's, not necessarily – he's still having these experiences. He's in his apartment. Uh, there's pro- There might be notes coming under the door. There, It might be in a bad area, but he's amplifying everything. He might have gotten kidnapped by Nathan Lane and Amy Ryan, but he's amplifying it to a certain degree that stresses him out more. Yes. But you're right. I think there's not – there's no way you could really amplify that last moment. There's a chance that he is just sitting on that boat in a lake and just mentally going over this entire experience and realizing, like, his own problems. And Richard Kind is kind of like his – for lack of a better word, conscious, but maybe like an, his insecurities, um, studying like you right. know all the like crappy things he's done, and that's like his guilt. Now you know whether he officially dies, um, or just like the guilt sort of <laughs> absumes him, which is not a word, but I'm just going for it. Um, I it's it's yeah, it's really interesting. I I just think there's so much of this that is amplified in his head without a yes. doubt. Yeah, for sure. And like that last bit, absolutely. I think I think it's a great way that you put it where like the whole last that last bit specifically could be interpreted as a metaphor about just like his own deep insecurities and rumblings about how like his mom like finally got to him, you know, even though it, it's so interesting where even when the movie is providing ample ample evidence that he is not at fault, it is still trying to cast him as being yeah. at fault. And I I and, and I'm like I don't necessarily understand why I'm I'm like, is he just like that? Like, like, does he have that much of a guilt complex? And I'm talking about Ari here, not, not, not the character (laughs) of Bo, but I'm only saying that because like I said, I think this is like the first time in a while where you can actually see the artists literally putting themselves in their work, you know? So it's interesting because in terms of like, you know, messed up relationship with parents and how that kind of ties into all of Ari's work. There's one other thing of his that I neglected to mention that I have seen. And I, and I think, you know what I'm about to talk about. It is the short film that he released oh. in 2011. The strange thing about the Johnsons. Have you ever seen I this? Seen this? Oh boy. Okay. Oh, so yeah. I, I will say I'm about to spoil the shit out of the short because go, I, go I, for it. Yeah. It, it has been... to be explained to be believed. But afterwards, you may want to watch it. You may not want to. This is a <laughs> 20 to 30 minute short film. And I remember I, I was sitting in my house and living up there, and I was like, I have to paint the picture here because this is this is gonna be <laughs> this is gonna be absolutely ridiculous. And. Um, and so I'm sitting there. I'm chilling my, with, with Dontre and our other two friends, Noah and Josh. Josh has been on the podcast before. And we're chilling there. And, you know, we're, we're watching YouTube videos. And Josh's like, hey, Dom, you, you know Ari Aster, right? You know, of Hereditary. Admits. I'm like, yeah, I know him. Why? He's like, you ever seen these short films? The strange thing about the Johnson? And I'm like, no, I haven't. They put it on. And I'm 25 minutes later, after we're done, I'm like, fuck you guys for making me watch that. This is a short film where the opening <laughs> is about a father telling his, like, 10-year-old son, is like, oh, you can love anything you want, you know? And his son is looking at pictures of his dad. And it cuts to about 20 years later. And this, and you have literally had the dad, who is now, has the most gaunt, just depressed look at his at his son's now wedding photo pictures. You know, they're, 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 they're taking their pictures for, the, for his son's wedding. Where his son 
for the last 20 years has been openly molesting and sexually assaulting his father. They even show a scene and like it's insane. And like they show the scene openly and vividly. My jaw is on the floor the entire time. The other guys were laughing hysterically at me. That was the one where I was on punked. And that was when I'm like, first of all, fuck Ari Aster for coming up with something like that. And I was like, fuck you guys for making me sit through and watch something like this. And I'm like, I'm just like, I didn't even know how to process this. I'm like, I'm sorry, man. This is, this is slightly on you because if someone told is. me, Hey, there's an Ari Aster short film. Oh, you mean where he literally has no rules where he doesn't have to worry about anyone buying his movie like, or seeing his movie. Oh yeah. No, I'll pop that one in. I like If I heard Ari Aster short film, I would leave the state. That see, those see, this are shows in. just how naive I was because <laughs> I, I immediately was like, Oh, I'm assuming it's just, I hear a title, the strange thing about the job. I'm assuming it's going to be like another haunting thing, you know, like yeah. a hereditary or something like that. Needless to say, that's not at all what it was. I remember Josh being like, yo, you see how he's smiling is like oh he's not smiling anymore when it comes to the wedding photos and i'm like oh my god and then oh, it ends, god. the last line i shit you not it ends where basically the dad has had enough because he like tries to like you know do, so he literally runs and gets hit by a car and kills himself and so basically you have the, the mom who has slowly been piecing things together and figuring out what's happening throughout the entire thing finally confronts the son at the end and the son's final words are oh i loved it better than you ever could and oh, then the wife geez. like hits him with a poker and throws him into the fire and i'm just like i'm like what what the fuck did i just watch like this is insane this is absolutely insane but yeah it was it, it was quite funny it was quite fun and in a weird way i feel like that's the most telling because like yeah. If that doesn't sum up Ari Aster in a nutshell, in a weird way, I feel like this is like this movie is like the perfect bow tie, if you oh, will, yeah. on like all of those couple of years of trauma. And so hopefully now we can move on to greener pastures, if you will. But probably not, because we're probably <laughs> gonna get something even more ridiculous. It'll be so the listen, fake greener pastures that uh you know Bo Listen, walks all through. I know is that if Martin Scorsese, if Martin Scorsese can get away with a four hour long movie that will be released in theaters. Who knows? Maybe Ari Aster might be able to get away with it as well. But I will say, if it's as well paced, if it's as well paced as this movie was, I wouldn't be bad. Because again, there were moments where I'm like, I'm like, I feel the length, but at the same time, like, I'm not mad. If that makes yeah. any sense, no, you know? I, like, I, 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 I really appreciate the length. Like, it actually, like, it was the first three hour long movie in a while that I've seen that like accentuates the subject matter and makes it like more appealing. You know? Yeah, I th that was weird. Like, yeah, the length doesn't bother me. And I'm not someone that gets bothered by length unless, you know, I mean, there are some 90 minute movies that I feel are too long. And oh, there's yeah. some three hour oh, movies yeah. that I feel like we could do more with. And so, yeah. I, you know, honestly, like I, it was, it was perfectly paced. And I thought about it because I was like really friggin' tired by the end of the movie. And so yeah. I was like, what could he have cut? And I'm like, I don't know if you could really yeah, cut I don't anything. think you could cut anything. Yeah, bro. like you I can't, like I, was everything, was, everything was earned. Yeah, yeah. deserved. Yeah, I agree. Well, like I said, uh, t timing of things and pace is relative. Just ask James Cameron, who still is mad that people will binge a full season of Stranger Things, but not his three-hour-long we, Avatar movie. We're binging it on a couch where we can stop and pee. I don't exactly. think he gets that. Like, no, he you know? doesn't. He's like, have to see it in the theater. Have to see it in the theater. Anyways, Sean, this has been an absolute blast, man. I, I couldn't have asked for somebody better to, to help break down and, and understand. <laughs> that, that's what this was. This is this is a therapy session of our own. We were trying oh, God, to understand. Yes. We were trying to understand this movie. So with that being said, before we get out of here, your final thoughts and your star rating for Bo is Afraid. So um, I, I do a letter rating, and so I gave it a B. So I guess that will equate to a four out of five. And, um, I, I you know, it, in some worlds, in some, like, factors, this could be considered a five out of five star movie yes. just because of how brilliant it is. But I, I, I just – it's just so strange where – it just feels illegible. I, I use the words, which it, it feels like, I don't know if this is an insult or not, but it was too brilliant where this is like that you're a friend who's too smart. And then it's just like, you, you got to stop talking, buddy. And yeah. I think this is what this was. Where it's just a like, little bit. Yeah. I definitely get that feeling at times for sure. Yeah. Um. I, I'm going to catch right in the middle. I'm going to say this is four and a half. This is easily yeah. the most entertained and the most fun that I've had with the movie so far this year. And like I said, it's easily, easily the best that Ari Aster has been, at least from what I've seen. So yeah, four and a half out of me easiest score i've given so far this year actually you know i can't even say that because it took me a because it took me like a day to process this so yeah i would say this is like the <laughs> nobody sort of can come out of this closest, one with an easy score. closest to like easy <laughs> easiest score yeah and i will say that for right now i'm officially saying that this is my number one movie of the year absolutely go. this it, it's gonna be i'm gonna be interested to see what movies hop it so i will say that before that we've only got one more week people of april and then it's guardians three and we're into the summer season and i will say stay tuned because this is the first summer in three years where we have actually got a summer movie slate. So what we're, what we're going to be doing is I'm announcing this right here. 
I'm going to be introducing a new segment of the podcast whenever we cover a big name movie that I will actually want to cover because unfortunately I, you, you, you couldn't pay me enough money to review that garbage ass looking Little Mermaid movie. But <laughs> we will be doing, uh, and, and I'm not racist by the way. I, I don't care that she's black. It's I don't not care that part. Disney, yeah, Disney, Disney's, Disney's, yeah, sorry, Disney, you're, you're not going to get me with that. Sebastian is an actual crab that's bothering yes, more and, than and the mermaid is black. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and it's the V dig. So you know there's going to be like a Hamilton rap in there at some point, you know? Oh, so yeah, so yeah, no, you, you could not pay me enough money to watch that movie. So yeah, so what we will be doing is we will be introducing a new segment where I'm going to be breaking down the box office at the end of each episode once we hit the movie. So, like I said, we've got a big jam-packed summer slate, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Fast X, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, Transformers, The Flash, Elemental, Indiana Jones, um, Oppenheimer, Barbie, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1, and capping it off with Blue Beetle and the Ninja Turtles movie in August. It's going to be a jam-packed summer. It's, it's going to be it's going to be full of stuff. Sean, Glad to have you back on, as always. Thank you so much for having me, man. Thank you, man. Oh, man. I better have you back on for another episode. So Definitely. We'll keep in contact. Yes. So, uh, Math Teacher Movies on Instagram, and I also have a podcast with Guy at the Movies, and it is the Guy at the Movies podcast, and uh, that happens – that's released every Monday – Except for this Monday where it's going to be an interview because uh, Joe and I slept in both days. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I said, uh, what's it called? You know, consistent schedule never hurt any, n- never hurt anyone. Also, when am I going to come back on the podcast? It's been like a year now, I think. Oh, well, yeah. Well, that was back when our uh, interesting little uh, Patreon we did where you came on for uh, Jurassic Park. But That's uh, right, yeah. And no, I, and I yeah, shat like, all over that movie that you guys <laughs> relatively liked. I, 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 yeah, I was a little bit mid. But um, I – um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Like Joe, Joe's the good, good with the guests. Guess I'm always the one that's just like, you know, Joe, here's like eight names I have. So like bring these yeah. on. And then Joe just tells me when guests come on. So definitely look at him with that, that one. Sounds good. I will get in touch with him as well. And of course, you guys can follow me with everything I've got going on at Movie Nerd Reviews across all platforms. Be sure to follow the official Talking TV podcast across all, across all platforms. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Twitch. This episode will be available on Spotify tomorrow. Follow Sean with everything that he's got going on. As always, people. 12 seasons of a short film and watch more fucking movies. Definitely in this case. We'll see you guys next time.